in pursuit of health and wisdom. Sapio with Buck Joffrey. Welcome, everybody. This is Buck Joffrey for Sapio with Buck Joffrey. And today I am going to talk to you about fasting. Okay, so but before I start that, I'm going to explain kind of like why I'm talking about fasting again, because we've talked about fasting, various uh, types of fasting multiple times in the past here. Let me give you some uh, background. So actually, I have been dealing with a great deal of back pain. I don't think I've ever spoken about this in any of my podcasts, but I have had back surgery three times now. Uh, arguably, maybe I should not have had those, but, uh, you know, a little bit too late. The first one, when I was uh, 15 years old, I had, for those of you who are uh, physicians or or know a little bit about the spine, I had uh, what was called a spondyl- spondylolisthesis uh, at the uh, fourth and fifth lumbar vertebrae. So basically, they were kind of subblocks they were kind of out of position and in order to create stability a uh, surgeon back then actually kind of wired them together which was uh, which lasted me about 10 years and then when I was in uh, medical school I ended up having a full-out fusion lumbar four or five uh, fusion and basically what that meant is they they took the you know the disc uh, out of the way they basically turned that fourth and fifth vertebrae into one big vertebrae big operation and uh, that actually helped uh, with pain for some time. Big operation for somebody in their, you know, mid to late 20s. And at the end of the day, again, I'm not so sure that that was the, uh, what I would recommend to the 20-something-year-old uh, my, uh, person who I was. But, you know, I was just listening to the, the neurosurgeons, uh, what they were telling me at the time. I was actually fine for several years. And then when I was about 40, I was ice skating with my now 15 year old, I think she was probably like, I don't know, maybe she was two or three. I don't, I can't do the math in my head right now because I'm fasting. Honestly, I can't even think, but uh, it was bent over and boom, herniated disc. Now this was actually a disc that n- was not right above the level of the fusion. That's what you normally expect when you have a fusion at a level and you have less movement, you expect the uh, adjacent disc potentially to, to have a problem because there's less uh, ability for that to move and so you can herniate that disc but the disc right next to it right above it was fine but the disc two levels above it the uh, second and third lumbar vertebrae the disc between there was herniated and I felt like I was being kicked in the groin non-stop and it was excruciating pain and again at that point I tried to get uh, something done uh, to fix it and honestly in hindsight again I don't think I should have been recommended surgery, but I was a microdiscectomy. I probably would have been fine uh, with, you know, some of the, uh, maybe if they had given me some sort of um, uh, steroid uh, injection in the, in the CSF, or there's some other things that you can do, radiofrequency ablations, etc. I've had a number of those things in the past, but at any rate, they did a microdiscectomy, and that was when I was, you know, about 40 and since then, I've had some constant uh, back pain flare-ups every year. In the last six months, it's been just kind of getting worse and worse and worse. I had been doing a lot of weightlifting, too, and I've uh, been, you know, trying to get ripped and stuff. And so uh, at some point, I was thinking, well, gosh, I should probably uh, also consider doing a little bit of uh, trying to lose some of this visceral fat at the same time. Well, as it turned out, I my back pain got really bad and I was going to I was just planning on taking, you know, a week or so off and I thought, well gosh, maybe I'll just do this fast during this week off and see if it helps because one of the things that fasting is supposed to do is to help with uh, inflammation. Okay, so that's the backstory. I don't know if that's useful, but that's that's what got me thinking about doing uh, this so-called fasting mimetic diet, which if you listen to episode 80, I believe it was 80 with Walter Longo, he's the guy who came up with the fasting uh, um, mimetic diet. It's a five-day fasting diet that basically makes your body think you are eating nothing. Well, it kind of feels like I'm eating nothing anyway, but I'm on day three right now. Let's kind of go through the whole fasting thing again, because I think it's important because I've kind of come around 
on this and had some opinions and changes and stuff like that, but we can also hit some of the basic science uh, as well. First of all, you know, just in terms of fasting, what I find fascinating, frankly, is that it's been part of human culture for millennia, right? And it's a part of lots of different religious practices, like across the board. It's not just one religion either. It's like multiple religion. And it's funny to me that something like that is so ingrained in our collective cultural DNA and maybe that in fact has these very powerful health benefits. And it's like, gosh, I guess our ancestors knew more than we gave them credit for, right? But it's really been in recent decades that scientific research has really started to uncover the potential health and longevity benefits of, uh, of fasting. Now, let's start, I guess, with the origins of fasting research, which takes us back to like 1935. Uh, and there was a study by Clive McKay, uh, and this is a Cornell study. And basically, he had, uh, in the Journal of Nutrition, uh, demonstrated, his team had demonstrated that Rats fed a, a calorie restricted diet, so lower than average, you know, calories per day. They lived significantly longer than normally fed counterparts. And um, the study, if you're interested, was entitled "The Effect of Retarded Growth Upon the Length of Lifespan and Upon the Ultimate Body Size." Uh, that was the first to be, you know, to uh, really evidence in the literature that really started to suggest that there were potential dietary interventions that could extend lifespan uh, by uh, eating less. Now, there was uh, a flurry of research into caloric restriction after that. And uh, over the decades, uh, a number of studies, multiple cross species, and there's no doubt about it. If you look at, you know, yeast to primates, caloric restriction, meaning like eating less than normal calories extends life. But um, a lot of people would say it feels like <laughs> it, feel, it doesn't feel like you'd want to live that long because of the way caloric restriction feels over a period of time. Okay, so caloric restriction is different from fasting. That's an important element here, too. Like caloric restriction, we know, increases um, across multiple species, does increase lifespan. In the 1990s and then early 2000s, research by Mark Matson uh, at the National Institutes of Health and Aging, um, he was really the one, I think, uh, who really started to elucidate the potential benefits of what's come to be known as intermittent fasting or time-restricted feeding. You know, it's this thing where you're um, only eating, say, like six to eight hours a day. And, um, you know, there's lots of variations to this, but I know a lot of people do 18-6, uh, 16-8, whatever extremely uh, common thing these days. And what Madsen had demonstrated in, you know, rodents at least was that, that, that intermittent fasting of this kind uh, resulted in uh, protection against neurodegeneration. Uh, and, and it, it actually uh, preserved cognitive function. So, uh, and one of the mechanisms suggested for that was a reduction of brain inflammation. So again, there is this you know, a recurring theme about inflammation, which also made me think uh, this might help my back, by the way. So, but again, we're talking about it, uh, intermittent fasting right now, right? And I want to make sure we make a distinction. Intermittent fasting, which is time-restricted feeding. His studies also indicated that the benefits of intermittent fasting were not due, as you might think, to an overall reduction in calories. Because again, yeah, you're going to eat six to eight hours uh, a day now, but if that just means you're eating less calories, then maybe it's the caloric restriction that's causing you to have health benefits, not, you know, not not the timing. But as it turns out, he controlled for that uh, and uh, was able to actually show that at least in rodents, uh, that it improved heart health, prevented symptoms of, you know, uh, dementia uh, in these rodents, um, and also uh, a number of other health benefits as well. But, you know, again, just to be clear, and that's, uh, first of all, you know, this is where a lot of the intermittent fasting buzz started. I mean, we, when humans started doing this, right, they hear, hear the, what's going on in rats and, and, and mice and all that stuff. I think it's important to emphasize that we are not rodents, um, at least most of us. And there is evidence, um, there certainly is evidence that time-restricted eating of eight hours or less that actually can result in human health benefits as well. 
even again when controlled for calorie reduction but you know uh, some of those benefits are like for example metabolic benefits right so time restricted um, uh, eating uh, has been shown to improve metabolic health and specifically like glucose regulation reducing body weight improving insulin sensitivity um, and those things are, are really, uh, really important, you know, for your long-term health. There has been some studies showing uh, improvements in cardiovascular health, like reducing blood pressure and, um, and uh, reducing atherogenic lipids, basically giving you a better uh, lipid profile and helping uh, reduce, you know, this, the uh, fatty liver and that kind of thing. Um, gene expression in circadian rhythms is another benefit. Uh, mood and mental health. But here's the thing. Uh, before you go and do this, uh, before you start, you know, doing what I used to do, which was skipping breakfast, you know, eating, say, from 1 p.m. to 7 p.m. That's what I basically what used to do. Let's talk about some of the potential pitfalls that are out there as well because this is uh you know this is real stuff and you don't want to just play around with this so i've talked about this on the show before but you know and and with the help of uh, dr walter longo uh, who pointed some of these uh, statistics out to me but you know there's been multiple studies that actually have shown that uh, skipping breakfast actually increase cardiovascular risk in humans. Okay, so there was a meta-analysis published in 2020 uh, that skipping breakfast was associated with a 22% increased risk of uh, cardiovascular disease, 25% increased risk of all-cause mortality compared to regular breakfast consumption. Okay, now again, I'm using breakfast skipper data here because Walter suggested looking at that because most of us who do who were doing, who are doing uh, time-restricted feeding, we skip breakfast, right? Another study uh, research um, from the Harvard School of Public Health uh, showed that men who regularly skip breakfast had a 27% higher risk of heart attacks or death from coronary artery uh, disease compared to those who ate breakfast. And then there was another study published in the Journal of American College of Cardiology that found that... Um, Skipping breakfast was associated with a higher risk of atherosclerosis, even after adjusting for traditional cardiovascular risk factors. Of course, there is uh, specifically, you know, there was this uh, this unpublished data that we've hit on a couple of times from the American Heart Association that suggested that shorter eating windows may increase the risk of cardiovascular mortality. In fact, in in that data, again, you know, in They've been under attack, the data, because of the way it was collected and all that. But it did show, uh, if you took the data on face value, that there was almost a doubling in cardiovascular mortality in those people who had uh, the shorter uh, eating window. So, so how do you reconcile this data, whereas you have all of these you know, potential uh, benefits that are listed, and then you have some of these um you know, when you put the breakfast skippers data together with the American Heart Association unpublished data, how do you reconcile that? There's lots of ways you can look at it, right? There's, you know, maybe there was something related to the timing of uh, food intake. I mean, maybe skipping breakfast, you know, leads to eating in the later in the day, which may disrupt circadian rhythms and, and various metabolic processes. So maybe it's not just about that window either. Maybe it's about moving that window earlier. Now, I don't know in the rodent studies, actually, I don't know if, if it was the, you know, which meals they were skipping, <laughs> frankly. So that's one thing to think about. You know, some people talk about overall diet quality. I mean, breakfast is skippers may, uh, you know, they may have a poor overall diet quality because they're, maybe they're, they're, they're less, uh, health conscious and, and, and they don't make as good of food decisions. I, I don't know, but uh, that's what some people say. And then, then there's a potential metabolic effect of eating breakfast that may help regulate appetite and insulin sensitivity throughout the day uh, while skipping breakfast could, you know, lead to overeating later and maybe uh, uh, the opposite of that, which would be metabolic dysregulation, right? So the, um, the bottom line is, though, that is... The idea of the short window uh, feeding 
does seem to give some short, at least what I would say is short-term physical benefits, but it's not clear to me what to do with the long-term implications here. And I know we've talked about this before, but I will just tell you again that I personally believe that if you're looking for, you know, intermittent fasting or time-restricted feeding, I would look at it as short-term intervention. Say you've got, if you want to get in better uh, you want to lose some weight, you want to, you know, get in better, uh, better metabolic, uh, health, whatever. I think that as an intervention in a short-term intervention, meaning something that you do for three months or whatever, seems fairly uh, innocuous to do. And it probably has some significant benefits, but the reality is that, especially doing this kind of uh, shorter window where you're skipping breakfast, I have to tell you that I decided personally to give that up because I think the risk benefit ratio uh, for doing this simply is not there for me personally, at least because I'm already in good metabolic health after doing uh, time restricted feeding for probably two years or more. Uh, now I just, you know, I eat breakfast. I kind of almost force myself to eat something, even if that's just some nuts or whatever uh, in the morning. I try to eat or drink something in the, you know, when I wake up. And then I try not to eat or drink anything, including water, by the way, for at least two hours before bed. And what that does for me is it gives me about a 10 or 11 hour window. of, um, and, and that is... Basically, what Walter Longo recommended anyway, he thought, uh, you know, that sort of 10, 11 hour just switch for circadian rhythms was a good idea. He, as you may recall, was not a fan of what we call uh, time restricted feeding because of all of the data that I just mentioned. So bottom line is I am not um, necessarily in the camp that believes in long term uh, time restricted feeding anymore. I just don't think that, uh, I, I think there's just too much potential long-term risk. And when I go back and I think about why was I doing that in the first place, to be frank, it was probably misguided because I thought that the benefits of intermittent fasting, again, intermittent fasting, time restricted feeding, I'm going to use the same terms back and forth that means the same thing to me six to eight hour windows that kind of thing i thought it was doing the same thing as what prolonged fasting actually does and it actually turns out that that's not the case okay so what is prolonged fasting prolonged fasting involves uh, abstaining from caloric intake for an extended period uh, typically more than 24 hours and um, and you know often for you know several days and it can range up to several weeks um I can't imagine doing that. Um, I should point out that what I am doing right now is the fasting mimicking diet, which was designed by Dr. Longo. And this uh, diet is basically, you know, it's, 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 it's uh, five days of food in a box. Uh, you know, it's like soups and little things like, you know, little bars. And it's, it's very low calorie, but it is enough food. It's um, low calorie, low protein, high fat, um, and it's consumed over a period of five days. The studies on this are that effectively it triggers you know, virtually an identical cellular response to prolonged fasting um, with, uh, that would result from like complete abstinence of food. So in other words, you're getting the same benefits of the prolonged fasting with a fasting mimicking diet, but you're not, you actually get to eat a little bit. Okay, I will tell you it's day three and I am hungry. So it's, uh, but I can't imagine having zero food either. So, okay, so what are those benefits that I thought I was getting with time-restricted feeding that I am supposedly now um, actually going to get because I'm doing, you know, a prolonged fasting regimen? For one thing, uh, enhanced autophagy. Okay, so what is autophagy? Autophagy is basically your body eating uh, away cells that are useless or senescent. There are often zombie cells, that cells that are just hanging out, not doing anything that, you know, might start releasing uh, cytokines and chemicals that could create cancers and all that stuff. The body, what it does when you're in a fasting state, it starts to eat away at itself, specifically 
it eats away cells that are not useful. So it's like, think about it as sort of, you know, doing spring cleaning and getting rid of all that junk. That's what autophagy is doing across various tissues, uh, damaged cells, proteins. Uh, and there's no doubt that the concept of autophagy is very much linked with longevity. Now, the thing is that, again, I thought I was getting that autophagy just from doing my time-restricted feeding. But as it turns out, it is really the uh, significant autophagy induction really doesn't occur, um, you know, minimum of 24 hours of fasting. And some studies suggest that autophagy really reaches its peak around 48 to 72 hours of fasting, which... By the way, I am, gosh, I'm probably somewhere in the middle of 48 to 72 hours uh, myself right now. So hopefully I'm eating away my bad cells. Okay. Another benefit um, of prolonged fasting or the fasting mimetic diet is, is I'm going to use those interchangeably because they're effectively supposedly the same thing, is that during the uh, this type of prolonged fasting, the body switches from... Um, glucose to its uh, to, to fat is its primary energy source. Uh, you may know that is, is basically going into ketosis, producing ketone bodies. And that's a metabolic switch uh, that has been shown to extend lifespan, uh, improve cognitive function in animal models. And you may be thinking to yourself, well, gosh, you know, there's plenty of people who do ketogenic diets um, and they're not fasting. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I think they do. I think you have to kind of train your body to get there. But I know for a fact, when I was doing time-restricted feeding, I was not in ketosis. And I'll tell you right now, earlier today, again, today's day three, I measured, you know, I did like a urine test to, for, to see if I had any ketones. And after, you know, on day three, I still have basically no ketone bodies uh, going. So I'm still not in ketosis. It typically takes uh, apparently two to four days of fasting to really get that switch, that ketotic switch going. And so again, that's something that I was not getting that I thought I was getting from intermittent fasting. Now, stem cell activation is a big one. Prolonged fasting, fasting rheumatic diet um, seems to um, activate a number of uh, stem cells. There's research on intestinal stem cells, um, basically, uh, um, you know, that were crucial for maintaining gut health, uh, hematopoietic stem cells, um, activating, uh, cells that, uh, for the production of uh, blood cells, uh, can improve immune function, um, neural stem cells, in other words, your central nervous system, muscle stem cells. So prolonged fasting can also activate uh, muscle stem cells, um, aiding in, in muscle repair and regeneration. Again, with my back pain, that was one of the things I was kind of hoping I would get from this. So we'll see. We often talk about some of the signal pathways uh, that are involved with longevity, specifically the downregulation of mTOR. mTOR is, uh, is uh, a mammalian uh, target of rapamycin. And for those of you who are on uh, rapamycin pulses, it's basically, that's what you're doing is you're downregulating mTOR. And, um, that is one of the most well-studied longevity pathways in, um, in, in longevity medicine and basic science. Um, and, and effectively the thing is, uh, that reduction in mTOR again, takes a while of fasting. It's like, you know, about 48 hours of fasting before you get that, um, reduced inflammation happens. It's supposed to happen pretty quickly for me has not really happened. Uh, it's as greater than 24 hours. I'm on day three right now. I still, I still have quite a bit of inflammation on my back and everywhere else. Uh, sirtuin activations, uh, AMP kinase pathways. So these are again those those major longevity pathways, and these are pathways that do not um, really. There's no reason to think that they get stimulated just because you're doing time restricted feeding. However, if you are doing prolonged fasting or fasting mimetic diets, these are definitely uh, pathways that you are triggering. And then uh, FOXO transcription factors. Now, FOXO, uh, you may have heard of the FOXO, FOXO3. These are actually um, genes that are found in uh, 
often in centenarians, right? So, and FOXO transcription factors basically means you're, you know, upregulating those genes. Those are involved with stress resistance, metabolism, cell cycle regulation, et cetera. But all that stuff, again, ends up being upregulated from uh, real fasting, but not from uh, the uh, intermittent fasting uh, type types thing. So bottom line is that um, perhaps I'm just trying to justify my own hunger right now. Uh, uh, but um, the uh, what I'm trying to do in this show is to sort of give you a sense for, you know, what I believe to be true, which is that t- time restricted feeding or intermittent fasting, again, in my opinion, uh, if you're going to do shorter windows, I, I think it's probably wise to think about doing those for a period of time as, as, as um, interventions to try to regain metabolic health. But long term, uh, I think uh, Walter Longo's research suggests 10, 11 hours is probably sufficient, mostly for circadian regulation. And then if you really want to do, if you really want to change your body with some of these things that fasting is supposed to do, all the things I just went through, uh, you might, uh, you might actually try real fasting or try the fasting mimetic diet, which is what I'm on right now. Let me see. I don't really have any, uh, I don't have any benefit to this. We'll try to get something in the show notes there to tell you where to get it, but it's basically from Prolon. Uh, and it is uh, Volter's company, although he uh, gives away all of his profits uh, back to science. Um, and this is a product that is uh, has been scientifically proven and uh, is also actually being used even in cancer patients. If you go back and listen to that interview, it's really fascinating. Probably um, the mechanism there is an upregulation of autophagy, any number of other mechanisms. But bottom line is, Certainly isn't going to hurt. Got, uh, I mean, it hurts now because I'm hungry, but it's worth a try. Uh, check it out. And if you do do uh, the FMD, if you do the fasting mimetic diet, uh, let me know how it goes. Shoot me an email, bucketsapiopodcast.com. Anyway, that's it for me this week on uh, Sapio with Buck Joffrey. This is Buck Joffrey signing off. Thanks for listening to Sapio with Buck Joffrey. A quick reminder that while I am, in fact, a surgeon, Nothing I say should be construed as medical advice. Now make sure to include your physician in any medical decisions you make. And also, if you're enjoying the show, please make sure to show your support with a like, share, or subscribe. Until next time, this is Buck Joffrey for Sapio with Buck Joffrey. 